<clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and finish up what we had left from the 1.7 section. And then I'm going to cover um, 1.8. Okay. So this is pre-recorded. Um, if you attended class on Wednesday, you'll notice I'm still wearing the same blue sweater. Um, but before I left today, I wanted to go ahead and pre-record this so that I could post it up for Wednesday. Um, or yeah, so today's Tuesday. I wore this on Tuesday. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and finish up the last two problems. And I did go ahead and review the web assign like I said I would. Um, but I didn't notice any of the problems on the um, web assign assignment for 1.7 that were anything extra that I hadn't covered or anything that we didn't discuss. So there's not really much left um, to do other than the last two practice problems in the 1.7. Once I'm finished with those two problems, I am gonna jump straight into 1.8. And so hopefully this video will not take the whole hour and 45 minutes, but I'm just gonna go through it and then however long it takes, that's how long it takes, okay? So let me change over to my paper camera. That's going to be a little bit better for you than just seeing my giant face on the screen. Um, there we go. So here are the last two problems from the 1.7. I did actually already talk about something that was of this form while we were in class. And so we talked about that if you take the absolute value of something, um, I'm trying to focus that a little bit. It looks a little bit blurry on my end. Um, maybe that will, I don't know. Okay, anyway, if you take the absolute value of anything, it really doesn't matter what the X value is. When you take that, um, when you take that number and you minus eight, the result could be positive or the result could be negative. But when you take the absolute value of that number, we know that that number is going to be a positive, okay? And so what you end up with is a positive number less than negative 12. However, this whole statement is false for any positive number. A positive number cannot be less than negative 12. Look at the number line, right? Here's zero, here's negative 12, here's all the positive numbers. These numbers are not less than negative 12. If they were, they would be on the left side, right? Less, left, right, LL. And this little thing looks like an L, LLL, <laughs> okay? So this uh, positive numbers are definitely not less than negative 12, okay? So because of that, there isn't going to be a solution to this type of problem. You'll also notice that on the previous page where it had all the formulas, it did specifically state that those formulas were only for positive, um, positive A's, positive numbers on that other side. So let me go bring that, um, bring that section paper back so that you could see what I'm talking about. Um, I am not finding that particular part of our notes today. Hmm. Well, I wanted to use it. Oh, here it is. I found it. Uh -huh. so where was it? It was these things. So when they had these absolute value inequality things, they showed you how to break up the absolute value so that you could solve it without the bars. You notice that no matter what the symbol was, all of these A values were positive, okay? So in every single one of these cases, you had to have a positive number over here, okay? If you have less than and you have a negative number, it just simply doesn't make sense, okay? Um, so therefore, um, if you do have less than, I should actually point that out. If you do have whatever's the expression in here and you have less than, um, a negative number, or if you have less than or equal a negative number, both of these situations are going to be no solution. Okay. 
And the symbol that you might see in WebAssign is this symbol. It's called the null set. And it basically means, or empty set. This one's a little bit straightforward, empty set. It means nothing is the answer. There is no answer, okay? No solution. That's what this represents, no solution, okay? But if you do have greater than a negative number or greater than or equal to a negative number, then in here, positives are always greater than negative numbers, right? Always. Um, and in this case, you actually cannot equal the negative like at all, okay? Um, you can be greater than it, but you just can't equal that negative number, okay? But in either of, in this case, you would say all real numbers are a solution, okay? So that would be negative infinity to infinity. So everything, no matter what you have inside that bars, when you take the absolute value of it, it is going to be greater than this negative pi. And even though I can't equal that negative number, it doesn't matter what's in there, it really will always be greater than that negative number. So this has the same exact answer of negative infinity to infinity, okay? You can't really put a bracket anywhere because you know that the infinities always have parentheses. So that's that, okay? But those are some special cases when A is a negative number. So when A is less than zero, you have these four situations and there's only one of two answers you could get. Either nothing is the answer or everything is the answer, okay? Um, so I did wanna share with you that little bit of information. Now, um, this section here, the next problem, I am going to use uh, that table because if you notice here, the number that we have on the right-hand side is positive. So in this case, I am going to use that table that I just showed you, and I'm gonna break this up into the expression on the inside equal to greater than or equal to the positive of that number, or the expression on the inside equal to, or less than or equal to the negative of that number, okay? So I'm just using the table um, and the information they gave me for when this value, when A was greater than zero, okay? And it told me to break it up like this. It told me if you have the bars in U greater than or equal to A to break it up as U greater than or equal to A or U less than or equal to the negative of A. Okay, and so that's exactly what I've done. But now I have to solve these resulting equations. So if I do that, I'm gonna minus two on both sides for this equation. And I also have to minus two on both sides of that equation. I get negative 5x greater than or equal to 6. Here I get negative 5x less than or equal to negative 10. If I divide by negative 5 on both sides, I get x and negative 6 fifths. If I divide by negative 5 on both sides, I get x and a positive 2. But because I did divide by a negative, um, that means I do need to flip this symbol over. So then it does turn into a less than or equals. Okay. And so I'm gonna do that on this side as well. Actually, this one was a less than. So when I divided by the negative, it actually flipped over and became greater than or equal to, okay? So then remember that there's the word or in between. So I wanna graph them both individually. And then I wanna put them together on one bar to get my final graphing, graphical answer, okay? So between these two numbers, the negative number would have to be on this side and the positive on that side. And I just like to line them up so that when I'm writing my final answer, I can do it. Um, it makes more sense to do it this way, okay? Um, this thing does not want to focus. I guess that's as good as it's gonna get. Let's see if I get closer. That's a little bit better. Okay, so then this says x is less than or equal to negative six fifths, which means I'm gonna do that. And it goes in this direction. There is a bar, so I am gonna have a bracket. And then this one says x is greater than two. So that means to the right of two. 
And then I am, it does have a bar, so I'm gonna have a bracket. Now the answer, the actual solution, the or part, okay, means you basically put both of these regions on one graph, okay? So I'm going to take this region and put it on the graph. And I'm gonna take this region and put it on the same graph. Now this is the or part. So I basically have put both of these together on one graphing line, okay? And this is the graphical solution. Um, but what I wanna do is I wanna give them the answer in interval notation, okay? So I have to remember that negative infinity is over here, positive infinity is over there. And so I'm basically going from negative infinity to negative six fifths. The negative six fifths has a bracket, Parin um, Infinities always get parentheses. This half is going to be a two with the bracket to infinity. And again, infinities always gets parentheses. To tell the person reading this that both of these are part of my answer, you do have to put the union in between. So remember that U, it stands for union. It means this in union with that, okay? And so I do have to have um, both of those as part of my answer. Okay, so that's the end of 1.7. Um, really not much to do other than to follow those tables. And then just remember when you're solving inequalities, if you divide or multiply by a negative on both sides, that you do have to flip over those symbols, okay? Um, 1.8 is more inequalities, but this time we're doing quadratic inequalities, okay? So they're gonna talk about it, then they're gonna give us an example, then they're gonna talk about it a little bit more and then we have some practice problems, okay? So for the first thing they're saying is that to solve a quadratic inequality, one that looks kind of maybe like that, right? You can use the fact that the quadratic or any polynomial can change sign only at its zeros, which is another way of saying X intercepts. But the way they phrased it is the X values that make the quadratic or polynomial equal to zero, okay? It's essentially x-intercepts, okay? Um, so it says between two consecutive zeros or two consecutive x-intercepts, um, a polynomial must be entirely positive or entirely negative. Think about this. You're talking about parabolas here because we're doing quadratics, right? So you're either gonna touch the x-axis there and the rest of the graph is all completely positive, or you could touch the graph on the x-axis and then it goes here. It doesn't matter whether you're to the left or to the right, right? It, that's not important. It's just you're touching the x-axis once and then it's going completely up or it's touching the x-axis once and then it's going completely down. The other alternative to that is if you go below and then now you're touching it twice, okay? And it doesn't matter where, it could be centered, it could be off-centered, the fact is, is that you're touching the x-axis twice. There are two x-intercepts. Notice that this is all positives and everything in here is all negative y values. Here we have positive, x value, positive y values and in here you have negative y values, okay? Even if your graph is flipped over, right? You still have those two um, x-intercepts all of these y values are positive and all of these y values are negative, okay? So that's what it means by this sentence here. So between the two x-intercepts, so between here, it's either all positive or it's all negative. And to the left, it's either all positive or all negative, okay? Um, so what we do is we use these zeros or these x-intercepts um, as key numbers of the inequality. And then once we have those key numbers, we map them out on a number line. And then we use the intervals that are created to test our inequality, okay? And so then they're considered test intervals. So here's what I mean. In order for us to solve this inequality, you first have to take this and turn it into an equal sign just so that you can figure out what those key numbers are, okay? So this is only temporary. This is not the actual problem that we're trying to solve. 
we're just using this equation to help us find those key numbers, okay? So when you do that, you end up finding out that you could solve this by factoring. So if I do x minus three times x plus one, or x plus one times x minus three, it's the same thing, right? You have to set each factor equal to zero. And when you do that, you find out that x equals positive three and x equals negative one. So these two numbers are your key um, numbers. And so what they do is you go to the number line and you mark those two numbers on the number line. So here's the number line and they've marked one and three, okay? And so you've got that there and you've got this there. What that does is it actually creates, if I draw a line like this, okay, at one and three, you actually create three different intervals, okay? Three different sections of the whole number line. And so this section can be written as negative infinity to negative one, okay? This section can be written as negative one to three, and the right-hand section can be written as three to infinity. Now we already know that infinities always get parentheses, right? But how do we know what goes on the negative one and the three, whether it's a parentheses or whether it's a bracket, okay? That has to do with um, your inequality. So since my inequality did not have a bar on it, that means that these guys are not going to have brackets. They're actually going to have parentheses. So if you use a parentheses there for negative one, you also have to use a parentheses here for negative one. And if you use a parentheses here for three, you also have to do it there, okay? And so that's really where those, how they determined what those test intervals are. Now, in order for you to test the interval, you basically have to pick a number in that interval and then test it, okay? So if I'm, let me see what they do. Oh, they don't tell you. Okay, well then I'm gonna do it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose this number to test in this interval. I like to choose zero if I can. So I'm gonna choose zero for this interval. And then I'm gonna choose five for this interval. I could have chosen negative two, I could have chosen negative four, I could have chosen negative one million if I wanted to. I just have to pick something in this interval. In here, I could have chosen zero, one, two, I could have picked 1.5, I could have picked negative a half. Any number in this interval is okay to test. And then the same thing over here, anything bigger than three, I could have picked 3.1 if I wanted to and tested that if I really wanted to. I just like to pick numbers that kind of make sense. If I can ever choose zero, I definitely do that one, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna test them into the original equation, okay? So I take this negative three and I basically plug it into the original inequality. And I check to see, is that actually less than zero? Because that's the, what I'm asked to do, right? So I don't know, let's see what we get when we type all of that in our calculator. Um, clear, negative three squared minus two times negative three minus three. I end up with 12. Here I end up with zero squared minus two times zero minus three, which is negative three. So I'm just calculating the left-hand sides. Um, five squared minus two times five minus three, I get 12. It's coincidence that this is 12 and this 12. Don't worry about it. Um, 12 is not less than zero. So this did not test out to be good, okay? That means that this region is not part of my solution, okay? Because it's false. Same thing on the right-hand side. 12 is not less than zero. So again, this did not test good. So this interval is not going to be part of my solution. But when I tested zero, I ended up with negative three is less than zero. 
this is true. And because it is true for this number in this interval, then that means this interval is my solution. So the answer for this problem would actually be negative one to three with parentheses on both sides, okay? This is the solution. That's the only interval that, test is, that tests correct, okay? You get true statement when you test that number in the interval. It wouldn't have mattered if I tested one or two or any other number, I would always have gotten a true statement in here. It didn't matter whether I tested four or five or 10 hundred, you still would have gotten a false statement there. And it doesn't matter what number you test in this interval, you'll still get a false statement there, okay? As long as your key numbers are correct, you only need to test one number in that interval to find out if that interval is a solution or not. So basically one guy speaks for the whole group, okay? So it says, this is just, it says to solve the inequality, you only need to test one value from each of these test intervals. When a value from a test interval satisfies the original inequality, meaning you get a true statement, you can conclude that the interval is a solution of the inequality. You can use the same basic approach to test the intervals for any polynomial. So this method, we will see it later again. Because yes, it works for quadratics, but it also works for all polynomials, okay? And so we will see that um, this method done again when we start talking about polynomials. Right now, we're just sticking to quadratics, a special small group of polynomials. So we already know this. It's um, just going over kind of like the steps on how to do it. So the first thing you need to do is basically change it to an equation and find those um, zeros, right? Those x-intercepts. And notice only real ones. So if you get imaginary x-intercepts, don't even consider those. You don't need to consider those, okay? Um, you arrange the, the zeros in order on the number line, right? They have to be in order. You have to follow the number line. If this is zero, make sure you're putting your negatives over here and your positives over there. If you have negative six and negative 10, make sure you know that negative 10 is over there and negative six is over here. They have to be in the correct order according to the number line, okay? Once you have put all of your key numbers on there, that's going to automatically create those sections, okay? So if these were my key numbers, I would automatically have three sections. I'd have this section over here, I'd have this section in the middle, and then I'd have this section on the right-hand side, okay? Three different sections. And then I would pick a number in each one of these intervals and test each one of those values, okay? And I do have to check them or test them in the original problem, the original inequality. If I get true statements, then that whole region is part of the solution. If I do not get uh, a true statement, if I get a false statement at the end, then that region is not part of my solution answer, okay? So let's see what they have as an example. So for an example, they want us to solve this. So the first thing you do is start trying to solve this equation, right? You just change it to an equal sign temporarily. And you notice that when you do that, you can factor it into this. And if I set one factor equal to zero and set the other factor to equal to zero, this is where they get the two key numbers from, okay? Then you would create your number line. So you have the number line here. Um, negative two would be on the left-hand side and three would be on the right-hand side. If I, I like to draw bars like this, just so that I can visually see the sections cut up. So then you notice that over here, this interval would be negative infinity to negative two. The middle interval would be negative two to three and the right-sided interval would be from three to positive infinity. We know the infinity should get parentheses and because there's no bar on my inequality, both of the numbers should have parentheses around them on both, um, both sides, okay? If this had a bar, then this would be brackets on all of them all the numbers, okay? Once we have those values, we're gonna test some numbers. So if I wanna test a number in here, I could choose like negative three 
If I wanted to pick a number in here, a zero is between negative two and three, so I would choose zero. And if I wanted to pick a number over there, you could choose four, because four is over there on that side, okay? So what they're doing is they're saying, in this interval, we're gonna test x equal to negative three. In the middle interval, we're gonna test x equal to zero. And in the, um, oh, what is this? In the right interval, we're testing x equal to four. And so I don't like the way they're doing this about the positive negative. What we wanna know is, is this stuff less than zero? Less than zero, less than zero, okay? That's what we wanna know. We wanna plug it all in and see if it actually is less than zero. So then when you compute all of this, you actually get negative three squared minus negative three minus six, you get six. Is six less than zero? No, this is false, okay? Then when you plug in zero, you get the negative six is less than zero. That one is true. Here you plug that in, you get 14 or no, 16 minus four minus six. You get a positive six and six is not less than zero. So this one is false. So the only region you should be taking is the region that turned out to be true, which means my solution here is only this interval that actually turned out to be true when I tested it. So the inequality is only satisfied for x values that are in that interval, negative two to three. And there's just another thing they're saying that in here we chose negative three and in here we chose four and in there we chose zero, okay? I do not like to try to test things in the factored version, right? Because what if you factored it wrong and then you're testing all the wrong stuff, okay? So I always like to just check it in the original. That's your safest bet to make sure that you don't get anything wrong, okay? Um, so they're just letting you know that if you were to graph this, if you were to graph it, if you were to graph it, you would notice that you have an x-intercept at negative two and an x-intercept at three, right? If I were to take that and plug in zero, I would get the y-intercept of negative six, which is this guy here. And then you would draw your parabola and whatnot. And um, if you notice, when is this thing, less than zero. That is asking when is this guy negative, right? That's what less than zero means. Well, where is it negative? It's negative down here, right? And those x values that that happens is, is between negative two and three. You just have to use parentheses because this does not have a bar on it, okay? So here's our first practice problem. It says, write your answer in interval notation. So I do need to factor this. I can factor out a GCF of two X. That leaves me with X plus two, <coughs> excuse me. And I'm gonna change it temporarily to an equal sign. Then I'm gonna set each factor equal to zero. I get X equals zero and x equals negative two. So when I draw my number line, um, zero would actually be on the right and negative two would be on the left on the number line. Um, and I need to test. So I've got, here's my sections there, right? This interval is from negative infinity to two. This interval is from negative two to zero. And this interval is from zero to positive infinity. I know the infinities get parentheses, and since this does not have a bar, it means that the two key numbers are also gonna have parentheses. So I'm testing these intervals. If I get true, these intervals are answers. If I get false, these intervals are not part of the answer. So I'm gonna pick a number over here like negative four. I'm gonna pick a number in here. I can't pick zero because it's a key number. It divides it up, but I can pick negative one. And then if I pick a number over here, I'm gonna pick positive one. 
So I'm going to test these numbers into my original inequality. And then the negative one, I'm also going to plug into the original inequality. And the positive one, I'm going to plug in to the inequality. So over here, I get two times squared. I actually end up with 16. Here, when I type that in, I actually end up with negative two. And here, when I type that in, I actually end up with six. Now, six less than zero is a false statement. Six less than zero is also a false statement. This is 16 less than zero is false. Six less than zero is false. Negative two less than zero is actually true. So that means that this section in here is the only piece that's part of my answer because that's the only place that I got a true statement, okay? So that means my solution or my answer is going to be that interval negative to zero, okay? I just wanna point out that sometimes it can happen where you get, anything can happen. You can get true, true, and a false. You could get true and a false, false. You could get two trues and a false in the middle. You could get two of them the same and two of them the same. All different kinds of things can happen. So never assume that you know what's going to happen, okay? Always test these intervals and find out whether or not they are true or false. So here's my last example for this section. So now it's telling me to talk about this problem. Well, remember, in order for me to find those key numbers, I have to solve the equation or solve this as if it were an equation. Now, this is a quadratic equation. Um, and because I do have a quantity squared, I know I mentioned this in class the last time, the easiest way to do problems that have a whole expression squared all by itself is just to do extracting roots. So I would automatically um, introduce the square root on both sides. And when I do that, I'm automatically going to make this square go away and I'm gonna actually end up with plus or minus. And the square root of one is just one. So I end up with two equations. I end up with X minus three equal to one and I end up with X minus three equal to negative one. If I continue solving this, I get X equal to four and I get x equal to positive two. So if I create my number line, positive two is gonna be on the left, positive four is gonna be on the right. It does create the in three intervals. This interval would be from negative infinity to two, but because it has a bar, this time I'm gonna have a bracket around that two. In the middle, it should be two to four, but again, because of the bar, it's gonna have a bracket. And in this interval should be four to infinity. Infinity always gets parentheses, but the four will have a bracket, okay? So that's a little bit different than the other two problems. We didn't have a bar, so we hadn't seen brackets yet, okay? But now we're gonna go ahead and test these intervals. So in this interval, I know zero lives over there, so I definitely wanna test zero. Um, three is between two and four, and I'll go ahead and just choose five, okay? And I'm gonna plug them into the original problem. So zero minus three is negative three squared, which is actually nine, and nine is greater than or equal to one, it's greater but it just has to be one or the other and it is greater. So this is true. Here I get zero squared, which is zero. And um, zero is not greater than positive one. So this one is false. And then over here I get two squared, which means I get four and four is greater than, than one. So I get a true statement. So this time two of my sections worked. So what is my solution? 
I have two parts to my solution. I have negative infinity to two, and I have four to positive infinity. And what do I put to tell the reader that both of these are part of the answer? You have to put in your union symbol in the middle, okay? But this is the solution there. Okay, well, that seems to be it for this particular section. If you check your solutions, those are actually the answers for this section. Um, and so we are done with this whole unit. And that took me, oh gosh, I don't know where the little timer is on this thing, but it did not take me as long as I thought it would take me. So. You do have enough information to get started with the homework assignment on this 1.8. Um, and I would suggest that you, that you look at the review, but we will cover the review whenever we do return to class in person on Thursday, okay? So that's the game plan is, um, this video was pre-recorded for Wednesday's class, which is 9.22. We're supposed to talk about 1.7, the rest of it, and 1.8, all of it which we've just done. Then Thursday on the 23rd, we're gonna go over the review. Sunday on the 28th, all the homework and the review are gonna be due in WebAssign. And then on Monday is on the 27th is when we're gonna actually have the unit C test. So definitely gonna be busy this weekend, trying to get all this math stuff done and preparing for that test, okay? This is the second to the last test for the 0314 class. So if you didn't do so great on um, test B or test A or both, you definitely need to do better on test C or unit C test and the unit D test, okay? So work with that and I will see you guys on Thursday when we talk about the review. But have a great day.